Howdy once again, and this is Tubal Kane, and this is Machine Shop Tips number 231, and it's the continuing saga here of my Atlas Craftsman 12 inch lathe. And in this uh, episode, in this video, as promised, I'm going to uh, show you the insides of the apron of the lathe. Remember that the entire assembly here, moving back and forth, is the carriage. The top part is the compound, then we have the cross slide, and it's the saddle here that rides the ways, and the apron is the front part here. Not unlike an apron that you might wear that covers the front part of your body. So let me show you how to take the apron off, and then we're going to examine the inside of it. I don't expect anything to be wrong with this one because this lathe has very little use. But uh, you'll see how it's put together, how to repair it if necessary, and just in general how it works, particularly the half nut lever. So let's get started. The first thing I have to do is to remove the lead screw. So that can easily be done, and I'm going to take it out from the right. Remember the lead screw passes right through the half nut lever, or the half nuts I should say, and uh, the apron itself so this comes off real easily and I'll just let the bearing uh, hang here if I can get it started here there we go and I'll pull it right out this would also be a good chance to clean your lead screw if it needed it Set that off to the side. Do not drop it. You do not want to bend it. And next come these two cap screws. On some lathes you're going to find those are uh, socket head cap screws, but on this older machine they're just big Phillips screws. And I even thought about replacing them with uh, socket head cap screws, but I guess I want to keep it authentic. Now make sure you use a large enough uh, screwdriver. That's the largest that I had. They'll probably be quite tight. I had a little trouble getting them loose, so I had to use a, a socket like that. Now, it's not going to come right off. And uh, you certainly don't want to drop it. But it is held on also, or not held on, but it's held in alignment with two dowel pins. So there's one right here and then one right on the other side as well. So I need to separate that because those were probably driven in at the factory and more than likely this has never been taken apart but I don't know that for sure. What I've done for safety's sake is I put the screws back in just finger tight and then tap them ever so lightly. Well, that really looks like a, well, it is a big hammer, but I, I certainly didn't use all the weight of it. I just tapped them, and it's separated nicely here, as you can see. And now, I'll back these out a little bit more, but I'm going to keep my hand on there. As you can see, that all of a sudden it came off, and if you don't have those screws in there, and you would tap it, and the separator, that would end up on the floor, and no telling what kind of damage would have occurred. So there it is, the apron, and it doesn't weigh very much. Here's a nice view from underneath, and you can see here two cap screws, and these are the two dowel pins that did the alignment. This is also a good view of the rack. Now remember, if you're a new newbie to uh, this work or machine work, or the rack is nothing more than a linear gear, a straight gear. And the rack is what uh, the pinion rides on and allows us, us to move the, the uh, uh, entire carriage back and forth. And of course now it's freewheeling just on the ways. And it's nice and smooth and well oiled. This, this is a nice little lathe really. And there you can see the the threading dial still hanging there and uh, when this is put together make sure that's all good and clean and then the carriage or the saddle is held on by this uh, piece you see right here I'm not sure what it's called and three screws that keeps the uh, saddle from lifting off of the flat ways remember that Atlas is one of the few lays to have flat 
ways as opposed to the ways. So that's enough of looking at that. Let's go over to the bench and uh, look at the apron. This is a worm's eye view and I'm down on my belly to take this picture but looking underneath the carriage before I go over to the bench I, I forgot to show you this. Can you see this gear up here? Well that gear is attached to the shaft of the cross feed here and that in fact is the gear that uh, will transmit the power to the cross feed for power feed and you'll see the gear that connects with that in just a second. Reminder that this is the model number for this lathe. The reason that I'm covering some of this is I cannot assume that everyone has watched all 11 or 12 videos in this series up to now. So uh, there might be some newbies here. Let's go over the, the controls here on the carriage real quickly. This is the carriage hand wheel, allows the carriage to be moved left to right. This is the half nut lever or the threading lever or the split nut lever. Opens and closes the half nut. It is used for both threading and longitudinal feed on this Craftsman lathe. And the third control is uh, this plunger knob moves in and out and that controls the power cross feed. And that's all the controls that we have on the apron so it's pretty simple. This is cast iron and nicely made. This is a die casting so is this. Whether they're Zamac or, or not, I don't know, but they are die castings. All right, here's the inside of the apron, and uh, it is fairly intricate, considering it's an atlas lathe, but uh, notice the different gears and the different uh, die cast parts here, and there's, uh, of course, the, the half nut, and uh, this bracket here, and all of that, including this, is apparently Zamac, but it could be some other alloy, too, but uh, the gears would be Zamac, but uh, well that piece there is magnetic right there but of course the gears aren't magnetic none of that is magnetic that's a steel gear and uh, that's a steel gear but that one is a Zamac gear I noticed that the smaller gears tend to be made out of steel I think that they would be too fragile out of a Zamac so, you know, they've got a reason for doing that now remember that the lead screw passes right through here and let me put it in place in just a minute here to show you that but what a nice gray iron casting this is and uh, look at the threading lever here the half knot lever when I'm or half knot I am turning the half knot lever and you can see it open and close. this one looks in remarkably good shape and I think you can see perhaps if I tilt this a little bit the mechanism that opens and closes it. These are easily replaced and I bet they sold a lot of spares. Not because of uh, abuse so much, it's just that these would get worn out using uh, the longitudinal feed. Probably never get worn out with threading because not that much threading is done compared to just uh, turning on the lathe. But uh, looking over here when you turn the carriage hand wheel, right there, there is a gear train. And ultimately the power is passed up here. And uh, this is the little gear, the spur gear, the, uh, the pinion gear that rides on the rack that I showed you a few minutes ago. And that's what allows the carriage to traverse from left to right. The lead screw passes through here and through this gear. But inside of this gear there is a key and it aligns with the keyway on the lead screw. Perhaps you can see it there. So the power that is transmitted uh, through these gears and into the cross feed is transmitted through the keyway, not the threaded portion of the, uh, of the lead screw. Many lathes were made that way where the lead screw didn't, uh, was, had no use other than uh, threading. And all of the other power went through a separate shaft and a key and a keyway. But when uh, this is turned by the lead screw, it's a bevel gear. Power goes to another bevel gear. 
and then up into this gear which turns the gear that I showed you when I was standing on my head and will uh, rotate the uh, lever right here for the cross feed. Now when I put the lead screw through here I will have to align that keyway with the key. So don't force anything if you got one of these apart. Now I really don't have any cleaning to do here. There's no chips in there. That's very surprising, which means that either that person was very anally retentive or uh, did never used an air gun to clean his lathes. Because otherwise those chips will get up in here. I guarantee it. And you'll see them in all of the gears and in the lead screw uh, and in, in the half nut right here. So that's how this entire system works. If you have to do any repairs. Now if you have any damage done to any of these parts that are die cast, there is no way to repair that. And I did have one of these at one time and it was cracked right through here. And was not repairable. There's a Gitz oiler right down here and that oils this shaft. There's a Gitz oiler right here, and that just lubricates the shaft right here. But take a look at this oiler. All that does is allow a passageway for you to... There it is right there. It allows the oil to drip into this little trough and work its way down into a hole right here. That's pretty neat. for lubrication. Now there's no good way to, to grease these gears. This can easily be oiled because you can just squirt your oil on the lead screw. But I will put some uh, gear oil on all of these gears before I reassemble it. This can be oiled because sometimes we just take our oil can and we squirt it up under the lathe onto the rack. Oil drips everywhere but at least the oil will get onto this. And then there's one, let me show you this, I guess I didn't show you this, but there is a gear right down here. See that gear? So that's on this bevel gear and that's the one that transmits the uh, power onto this spur gear right here. Then one more thing here. This is the power feed for the cross feed on and off. So you are engaging it and disengaging it. Now let's take a look at the way these controls operate when we're on the inside of the apron here. And I, this is getting to be a long demonstration, but you know, it's a pleasure talking to you guys because you listen and you have long attention span, or at least you do if you've stuck with me this long. But in the high school, demonstrations had to be short and sweet, limited to 10 minutes or you really lost the class. They, they wanted to get to work. They wanted to make some chips. So I'm, uh, I've never given this demonstration before in my life, but I'm doing it now. Let's look how it works now, first of all with the cross feed, and of course the lead screw would be rotating like this, and as it rotated the power uh, was caught by the keyway here in the key into this gear from one bevel gear to another and then uh, that spur gear down here to this spur gear and then this spur gear or pinion was on the rack and we had a rack and pinion going and that would allow, of course this could be moved in and out, to engage with the, uh, with the rack. And that was, boy, which way am I going here? That was the power cross feed. There, wow. That's the power cross feed in either direction. And if you wanted the direction reversed, of course you used the feed reverse lever. When the half nut lever was engaged and the half nut, split nut, clamped onto the lead screw and it rotated, of course the carriage immediately started following the lead screw and it moved the carriage either left or right depending on the feed reverse lever. 
few minutes ago I told you something incorrectly and I'm correcting it right now. You see this pin here which I claimed was just a, a detent. Well it's not a detent at all. But uh, notice now, first of all I'm going to uh, release the half nut lever and watch it go back. And now I will engage the uh, cross feed if I can right there. Now the purpose of that pin is to prevent you from using both the cross feed and the longitudinal feed at the same time. So right now I am unable to engage the half nut lever because the pin interferes with this gear. Now watch again as I release that and now I am able to operate the half nut lever. So that, that's just a safety device so you can't feed in two directions at the same time and why would you ever want to <clears throat> although I remember somebody telling me 40 years ago on a certain lay that you could feed at 45 degrees by using both at the same time but obviously it was not an atlas lathe. I think I told you much more than anyone would ever want to know about an atlas apron but before I put this back together, I'm going to apply just a little bit of this uh, extreme pressure lube number three onto the various gears here and because those are the gears that are not easily lubricated after assembly. Here's my Logan lathe and uh, this is either a 10 or 11 inch, I, I've, I've forgotten. But it's a lathe of approximately the same capacity as the Atlas, but look at how massive the uh, apron is on here compared to an atlas. This almost looks miniature or toy-like in comparison to this. And that is uh, one way that uh, Atlas was able to keep the price down. It's just, as you can see, a light-duty lathe in comparison. Let's make that same comparison here with the 10-inch heavy South Bend. And here it is compared to the South Bend Heavy, 10 inch, a mere toy. Never assemble anything uh, dirty with chips in it, so clean it thoroughly if it needs it. This wasn't bad, and I have already applied a little bit of, of this to all the gears, and uh, I've scraped this surface here, it wasn't bad, but I scraped that both here and the mating surface, on the machine and just a few drops of oil don't make a mess of it but just a few drops of oil and here's a little oiler right here too for that uh, that slide make sure that nothing is dry spread that around and now this is ready to put back on and back together it goes and that was very simple and tighten up the two screws equally because you're drawing it up into the the alignment dowels, the dowel pins. Back and forth just like you're working on an engine head. And then I'll do my final tightening here with with the little uh, ratchet. Actually, I need a bigger Phillips than that, and that's the largest that I had in stock, unless I can't find a bigger one. I've got so much stuff around here. For your information, the diameter of the lead screw on this lathe is three-quarter inch, and it's eight threads per inch, and that seems to be a standard size for these smaller lathes. And as I threaded it through, I lined up the keyway with the key in that gear that I showed you earlier, and now I need to line it up right over here. And I just turn it until I feel it go in. And I'm not feeling it yet. There it goes. And then I will go down to the other end and uh, put these screws in off camera. Everything is good and tight. I put a little bit of oil here on the lead screw from one end to the other. Let it work its way in. Oil this bearing, although I did that the other day, and then oil the fittings here. And uh, this job is complete. And I hope you enjoyed this little video as much as I enjoyed making it.
on the inside of the apron of the Atlas 12-inch lathe, and this is Chubukane saying, so long for now.